I, you know, I just have to say a few things. It's really funny because this is not the presentation that I was going to give today. <laughs> My presentation's on the forces of involution, the negative trickster archetype. And it's still going to be about that. I just need some sort of guidance because I have no memory. But maybe, maybe, because, you know, that's what alchemy is. So maybe this isn't the talk we wanted, but the talk we needed. Involution is a process that is a part of creation. So in a sense, it's a part of alchemy because alchemy is the divine chemistry. It's how creation's nature comes into being. And so how we know that it comes into being is through many different processes, but they can be summed up as processes between an involuted state and an evoluted state. So an involution and an evolution. And when it's in an involuted state, meaning the opposite of evolution, that doesn't necessarily imply that it's negative. But there are, like with everything else in this reality, negative aspects to involution. And so involution in its most positive sense of the term can just be seen as the outbreath of creation. We're, we're immersed into our creation. And that's why we see within Gnosticism and, you know, its counterpart, in my opinion, Hermeticism, going like prison planet or <laughs> potential paradise. Like, like it's because it's because of the positive side of involution, which is one could look at even just neutral rather than positive. But it's like being in creation, being in the artwork, the material realm. So we're so immersed inside the artwork. It's, it's known as being like a, almost a meditative state, like when you're doing something you love, so much so that you forget about time. And then there's, of course, its counterpart. Like everything else in this reality, it has a positive or exalted expression and then a negative or detrimental expression. And so when, involuted, when involution is in, it is involuted <laughs> in its negative form, that's when it is pulling consciousness into a sleep state. It's the forces within creation, the archons, that are the extensions of personified forces of separation within the cosmos that act as the ways within ourselves, so the inner and outer world. But the forces of involution are the, the ways that we see in the external realm as well as their matching corresponding parts in the internal realm that pull us into the sleep state of unconsciousness or skepticism. And so the, the involuted pro, the involution has a swing, which we know in Hermeticism as the law of rhythm. And so within that swing, we have the Nature compelling itself into one impulse, which is one side of that swing. And when it's in, when it's compelling itself into this one impulse, it's to materialize, but not just materialize. It is to fragment so thoroughly into the material that it calcifies. And so really involution in its worst, most negative interpretation of this esoteric term is to calcify. It is to disconnect one from spirit so thoroughly that it looks like Mars, <laughs> which is why some people are obsessed with Mars. So yeah, so the first wave of ascension. <laughs> Everything happens in waves. Consciousness evolves through spiral dynamics that are expressed in the form of a wave. The wave is not the water. The water merely told us about the wave moving by. Do you get that? Do you get this? The water is just the medium. The water wasn't like, oh, the waves are from water. No, the water is showing us what's happening beyond the water. It's showing us what we would see beyond the physical, beyond the calcification. So that's pretty cool. So that's just to show that, you know, consciousness is either spiraling in an upward trajectory or a lower trajectory. 
which in what we just went over, that, that swing in a lower spiral would be involution, calcification. Where is, do the tricksters come in now? I love the trickster archetype, actually. It was hard when I was making the original presentation just because I am a trickster archetype. And so it was fun to, you know, talk poorly of the trickster archetype just because it's cheap. We all know, well, we might not all know, but uh, many of us know already the negatively inclined attributes of the trickster archetype. So for me, it's like there's not enough spotlight on the positive aspects of the trickster archetype, such as Jerdef, Hermes, like pff, those two alone. But yeah, so we're not talking about the positive ones. You guys have to stop making me go off track. We're talking about the negative ones. <laughs> and in the negative inclination of the trickster archetypes, we have archons, classic example of archons. Because when we talk about malevolent, or I like to call it hostile, it's more generous, terms of personified forces in nature, the cosmos within, without, there's a lot of different gradients of those. They're just not all archon or they're just not all trickster. But the archons are the perfect embodiment or <laughs> disembodiment of the negative trickster elements because archons rule what we know as fate. And the trickster elements are completely tied to free will and therefore it's opposite or rather it's counterpart fate. So when we're talking specifically about the trickster archetype in its negative orientation, what we're doing is we're talking about the negative side of what we correspond with in our psyche, which is known as determinism. Now there's positive elements to determinism too, but we're not going to cover anything positive today, <laughs> unless it's on this presentation, which was really positive. <laughs> so focusing on the negative aspects of that thing I just said, there's this, there's this way of looking at things that needs nuance in between it. But before we get to the nuance, we're just going to look at them broader and black and white. And that's determinism would be linked to calcification. It would be linked to everything's predetermined. Therefore, it is out of your rule. What are archons? Rulers. It is out of your rule. The very fact that things are overemphasized in a determined way is one of involution and is one of determinism. Now how the trickster archetype comes into this and why I would link heavily the archons with being trickster archetypes rather than, you know, like we have, I'm sure you guys are in the know, like there's reptiles, <laughs> there's other forms. <laughs> there's other ones, but you know, like who's to say that the, yes, just because you're a hyperdimensional stalker that you're good at it. The archons are <laughs> tricksters because what they're doing is always trying to move you around your own sovereignty, to move you around your own um, free will, to make everything look calcified, inevitable, determined, involuted. And so in its most, you know, exalted state, we can look at them as the forces that, catal that catalyze us, that we push against in order to break into that sovereignty. That's being generous. And then what we have from that would just be other, like they, they are the metaphysical extensions of our own fragmentation. And I don't know who else may have, whether it's an inner or outer, but I will just ruin the surprise for you. It's both. <laughs> it's, the, it, it's not just how we correspond to them. At this level of reality, we are creators, whether we remember that or not, whether we access our free will, therefore our sovereignty or not. And so because of that, we are, a, we are the archons as well. <laughs> it's just about how much of that spectrum do we correspond to. And when we're in the determinism, we are being tricked. 
They're always doing things to trick us out of our sovereignty, even if it means blaming the external forces, which I'm all about, by the way. I dig that. But yeah, we, we allow them when we're not using our, when we're not harnessing our sovereignty, we allow them. I don't even mean allow them in like, a, like they did it, like we're giving away our emotional and mental life force for them to create timelines literally create timelines. That's what the trickster archetype that the archons embody do. They trick you into creating your own timelines uh, to make everything look like, oh my God, I have no power in this and this is happening to me. And then just keeps affirming that through its own inner dialogue, outer dialogue, dialectic, which we know um, as the Hegelian dialectic. That's a perfect example. The Hegelian dialectic is a perfect example of how it was never meant <laughs> like to be what it is in this age. Like it, it's brilliant in this age, knowing the cause and effect or problem reaction solution. That's the trickster archetype. It's using dialectics. It's dance, it's prancing around, you know, talking to itself to go sign off on something, to go create a timeline for the aggregate um, that just once again goes further and further, further down into looking like you're, we're not creating anything at all. And it's because of that powerful dialectic that's done within our inner and outer dialogue that's going on. So when we're not in our spiritual sovereignty, we're in the forces of involution, calcification, which is to make it look, what's calcification? Like if we, even if we're just looking at it visually, it's nothing, it's inertia at its like highest embodiment. It's like that. And because of that, we have this um, notion, we're getting affirmed and affirmed through that notion that we are that, and we are simply the observer of whatever is being created. Um, George W. Bush said that in one of his talks one time, because, you know, they like to say things just out in the open and laugh because <laughs> they control the media. So they say things and then they laugh because it's like, I could even say that. They even do that. They do talks where they go, look, I'm going to say this. <laughs> I just said it. I just said it and nothing's going to happen. So in one of those talks that he was doing, he was saying, you're just going to we're just going to keep creating a reality and you're just going to keep watching it. And then we're going to do it again. And we're going to create that reality. But yeah, so let's see what's the, what the, on the next slide. <laughs> Gaia's ascension. <laughs> this is what they don't want us to have. <laughs> the same way that airplanes require ground acceleration for takeoff, Gaia's ascension is actualized through emotional and mental catalysts that disrupt the existing level of consciousness until it reaches the next octave of consciousness. The catalysts and disruptions are meant to reorganize our mental, emotional, and etheric template so that we can integrate more of our multidimensional self. So this is what they don't want us to do when it comes to being able to use these catalysts that they, they give us. And I know that there's so many varying degrees of motive, right? I don't think anyone in the conscious and spiritual community actually disagree that this is being done. If I, if, if I'm wrong, I just have not met somebody that disconnected from reality, but what is up for debate is what people think the motive is. It's like, is this for our highest ascension? This is all for our, it's to awaken us or it's completely on the opposite end of the spectrum. And people go, no, 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 this is like prison planet. Um, but yeah, within that spectrum is free will that even applies to what's being done. Free will applies to what am I going to make this mean without whatever the hell George W. Bush was saying. So when we decide what it means, we're an alchemist. Because we go, you know what? These are disruptors and catalysts to reorganize our mental, emotional, and etheric body and template. 
And so I have my own theories actually as to why a lot of people are in the skeptical vibration. They're vibrating at that level. I think that when we split into such a polarized state of dimension, that there's naturally going to be, I don't think the Gnostic said it like this, but the Gnostic said this, there's going to just naturally be different divisions of consciousness. And some of them are going to resonate and correspond with the like attracts like, like corresponds to like. So within an inherent division so thoroughly into physicality, there's going to be even the split in consciousness. And that split in consciousness would be some can only correspond with involution, while others can only ever take whatever is being handed to them and turn it into gold, no matter how much crap it is. But that's just my theory. Let's see what's on the next slide. Uh, yes. Chaos as a catalyst. Chaos is volatile, nonlinear, is static energy. Its primary function is to destabilize. Who here has heard the uh, occult term order out of chaos? Yeah. Once again, that's their aims. What do we make of that? Because theirs is to use manufactured consent and order out of chaos. That's how the trickster archetype, when it's embodied, you know, through the elite and, and higher up the chain than even that. That's what they're doing. And they're doing that on repeat. And it's not even sophisticated. It is not sophisticated. I will do a video on a tactic that I don't think is sophisticated, but that I will still call the most sophisticated just because that's where humanity's at at the moment. But those two are not sophisticated. <laughs> it's boring. And we see this done over and over again. Who knows what manufactured consent is? So manufactured consent, for those who don't know, is when they, powers that were, I like to call them, forces of involution, archons, they like to pretend that people agree with them. <laughs> and when they pretend, when they manufacture, they're completely fabricating. What they're doing is showing authorization. They're literally legitimizing themselves. And you get enough people to buy in to the fairy tale fabrication that whatever you're saying and manufacturing is legitimate, you become an archon. Because archons, the name is rulers, so you rule. Back to the trickster archetype. So manufactured consent is one of the biggest plain as day tactics. It's done every single day down to even like movie sets. They put like a cheap green screen behind them and like five people <laughs> who are clapping for some politician or whatever they're showing, it's 1000% fabricated. And then we see that on the news outlets and we're like, oh my God, yeah, you know what? Yeah, okay, people agree with that. Yeah, yeah, why not? If we were in an astral realm, I'm not gonna get into the astral realm when it comes to this, but if you get into an astral realm, when we're talking about this, it would be like, an entity coming up to you and availing themselves of someone and then you using your sovereignty to go like, no, you're not. And then they go. Phew. But unfortunately, if we're looking at a TV screen, we can go, no, you're not. <laughs> and they go, <"Phew." laughs> That would be too easy. <laughs> so, yeah, so they do it through manufactured consent and then order out of chaos. Order out of chaos is just one other paradigm or faction of what was being said about you create the problem and then you create the solution for it. So you destabilized. You introduced chaos specifically to destabilize. Creates confusion within our energy field that forces an expansion of awareness. So that's actually a very strong point about confusion when it comes to the trickster archetype. They employ confusion because confusion produces fear. And when you use confusion intentionally, 
to produce fear, you're not only like in a lower vibe, you're in a energetically, you're in energetic paralysis. When you're in an energetic paralysis, you give up the adult archetype or what we know as the neocortex. You start going into the lower primitive mind, like attracts like. You start going into the reptilian survival mindscape. So when you're in a traumatized state through trauma-based mind control, that's producing so much shock, so much shock, so much shock, that even if you, you couldn't help but have one, if not all layers of your energy field in a state of confusion. But the interesting thing about shock and confusion is, is that it's also one of our greatest allies in awakening and healing. Because in order for certain things to come back online, uh, certain shocks need to be applied. They talk about this in mysticism, like so much. As a matter of fact, to the point where shocks become the most precious thing for awakening. To the point where if you're in shock, whatever made you in shock, you have to stop and just go. And now you got the goods. You got the shock, you got into that level so that once you're in that level, now you can heighten your self-awareness. This isn't, uh, I come from fourth way tradition. So Jardef talked so much about that, but also this concept, even Krishnamurti talked about it. I'm not sure if he used the term shock, but yeah, shock and awareness. And so being in a state of confusion doesn't inherently apply negativity, fear, paralysis, calcification. It just can be used that way. And so the trickster archetype as the archon is using all of these methods in order to create legitimacy, fabricate consent, and then use the magic, harness the magic of our emotional and mental bodies so that we're on a downward trajectory. And that is what is also known in like a deeply fringe aspect of esotericism as holographic inserts. Who here knows about holographic inserts? Who here knows, knows what louche is? Yeah, man, I said louche. I came up here and I was like, you're not going to say louche when you come up here. That's cheating because it's too easy. I like to do things where I have one hand tied behind my back so that I grow. <laughs> I was like, don't say louche. <laughs> Um, it's to harness our emotional and mental capacity for confusion. Cause in confusion, do you know how much energy you're emitting of overwhelm of all these different flavors, all these different, like if we saw things from a fourth density viewpoint, when a person is in like a heightened state that they were brought to through some sort of like intentionally in inflicted trauma, it emits so much more creative energy than if it was in a more defined and determined stagnant state. And so confusion is the doorway. It's like the prep. You need confusion because that is prepping to get into the portal of the subconscious. And so they infuse confusion, 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 so that there's this shock, 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 because then enough of that just opens the door to the motherboard of our sub, of ourselves, which is our subconscious. And when you're in the subconscious, now you start playing with the keys and codes of reality. And those create what we know as holographic inserts or just another more easier way of explaining them is Mandela effects, timeline shifts, timeline shifts where you're like, wait, what? Where they, they weren't like larger timelines. Humanity ultimately, when we're in our free will, creates larger timelines. And so getting into the subconscious is the way to create holographic inserts or what we know as just you know, not long-term, not powerful, you know, like they, if we use our free will, if enough people are in their sovereignty, no matter how much effort they put into these, the time of these inserts or jumping of timelines would be way shorter.
but it's because they manufacture consent that were on them longer and they look realer and they look more calcified, meaning more inevitable, more determined. And I'm not saying like, oh my God, you guys, fear is creating that. And if you just love, then it won't happen. But what I'm saying is, is that that's how they do it. They do it the whole way where they go like, okay, it's going to be done. And then they test the field. They got permission. Okay. Now we're going to put this out. Okay. Oh, got permission. So the manufactured consent is like, is grandiose. Knowing this is vital to be able to, like a trickster's is like homeopathy. You could, it's the dog of the hair that bit you. <laughs> to, in order to, in order to o- overcome arconic forces, we must understand and have some of that medicine within us because that's also the key to our sovereignty. They're teaching us in a very backhanded way how to be in our sovereignty, showing us how to access dharma. Dharma and sovereignty are the same thing. I would love to do a talk on dharma, but they're the same concept. They're the open space of the present moment where nothing before had entered into the now. Everything before is karma. So that's why archons are known as the lords of karma, saying them as tricksters, um, corresponds to having them be rulers of fate but fate and karma you could they're just like they're interchangeable and so having them be the rulers of karma is literally pointing to the opposite of karma which is dharma so being in dharma is sovereignty being in dharma is being in the free will and when we access these points of free will what we're doing is sending out within the morphic resonance field how to do it. And then we're making that template larger. Mitch talked about Rupert Sheldrick, and I love Rupert Sheldrick. His book was the hardest book out of all the books I've read to read. Um, and so, and he said something in there about how, why why selected pressure was wrong. Who here knows the term selective pressure? It's how we evolve. Should do a talk on that too. (laughs) But why it was wrong, and I thought that that was so smart of him because he explained it and I didn't understand him and I normally understand things. And I was like, okay, this guy must be really smart if he explains something and I couldn't understand it. But the morphic resonance field is like his his greatest, in my opinion, contribution. And I'm sure that there's so many links throughout history of this concept, just maybe more in like mystical terms or different terms. But I know it as the morphic resonance field through his work, and it is like a guiding light. It's also what people in the New Age community bank on. It's known as that 100th monkey effect. And that's done through, it's not that, but his, he explains whether he knew he was backing that up or not. He was explaining the science behind the hundredth monkey effect. And so that's what sovereignty is. Sovereignty is something that is so powerful in the now moment that when they're pulling the manufactured consent or the order out of chaos, we are not Invo- we are not declining, de-evolving, going into involution. We are not going into the karmic patterns of inevitability. Instead, we are bringing forth through our action, through our words, through our vibratory field, through all levels of our energy field, um, what we do want. So if we want more truth in the world, we speak that truth. I don't think people here have a problem with that. Normally I have to, (laughs) you know, gently help people into their truth. I work with clients a lot that are um, amazing. I like just, I'm so grateful for my clientele. But one of the biggest issues I see is being in the spiritual closet. And being in the spiritual closet is crazy place to be in because the the whole world (laughs) doesn't share your beliefs. And when you're in the spiritual closet, you're not going to get your needs met. So you can't even go in the direction of, well, I will, you know, 
eventually find people. But that happens through speaking your truth. That happens with, you know, having enough integrity. You know, you don't have to be fully in integrity, but that happens through being in enough integrity with yourself that your thoughts, meaning your inner reality, match your outer reality. And that's another way that trickster archons bank on us being determined by fate and determinism. It's not getting uncomfortable enough to go out of the spiritual closet or go out and speak our truth. So when you have just a bunch of manufactured consent going around in a circle and it looks like nobody agrees with you or even the few that you, you know, yes, you have people that agree with you, but yes, this and that, like, then it's, it, it looks too overwhelming of a puzzle to even try to put together. So the first wave of ascension is what I sum up as like the people who are in the embodiment phase of evolution. The embodiment phase is, is like, yes, we've embodied our warrior aspect. We have attuned ourselves into integrity. Our inner world matches our external world. We are being the truth. We are living the truth. We are speaking the truth. We don't like what's going on. But we're a little bit in analysis paralysis. And now we've lost our higher link to spirit. That's the second wave. They mean well, and we need them. I need them <laughs> because I don't fight with people anymore. But the second wave of ascension will fight with people. So they're the people who are going to go to town on like fluoride or go to town on things because they have that awakened heart center. They have that warrior aspect where it's coming from righteous indignation. It's coming from like heart centered anger. I know Anger is portrayed a lot of times as being unspiritual. I'm trying to work on that just like black. But anger is actually an, a, the most appropriate response to living and coming into an extraordinarily ingenuous world. And I don't know how other people do because I'm angry all the time. <laughs> but it's because of that. It's because I'm insulted. I know even being insulted doesn't sound very spiritual, but I'm constantly insulted. That's because I know better. And so when we're looking at things like, like second wave of ascension, first wave of ascension, it's not like the first wave of ascension that's going through embodiment has all their stuff figured out. It's just that they're focused on the embodiment of the, the being vulnerable, seeing their blind spots. That's where the tricksters come through. They come through our blind spots when we can't go and look at, wow, I'm angry. And you know what? There's actually, you know, like they go through the, wherever you are, wherever your vibratory rate is located, they have a new specialized way of treating you versus somebody else on a different level. This isn't a one size fits all approach, which is why it looks sophisticated. It looks sophisticated because it's tailored made. Each person has their own belief systems, comes in with their own perception. So not everything is going to be the same across the board. And so what they do is, oh, you're, you're vibrating at the second wave of ascension. Okay, well, let's lock you. Let's phase lock you into that phase. Why don't we phase lock you? You could do a whole bunch of things. I know people who are extraordinary about talking about certain concepts um, about space or the lack thereof. And you can tell at a certain point that the phase lock, if you, if you get really clear, the phase lock is that they've created a whole identity now on being the person that talks about space or a lack thereof. Is that everyone? No, that is a very, like the trickster archetype doesn't care. They're, they're like, you're mustard. Okay. It's mustard. Your ketchup? Okay, it's ketchup. It's, it, it knows that there's going, it's very sophisticated, very sophisticated. It knows that there's going to be alterations. There's going to be growth. So why not always just produce an effect as though you're continuously going on a, a growth cycle when it's not? And so that's when we go inward. So what I would call the first wave of ascension is when we go within to go figure out how the archons are using our internal world to phase lock us into whatever we are strongly identified with there. I mean, to the point where you guys, I'm almost like this much over the term alchemist <laughs> and I've created my brand on it. And I'm like, shit, <laughs> because 
I am so not okay with phase locked. I'm like, I'm game. What, what do I got to see today? <laughs> There's this funny spiritual meme going around where Buddha goes, and once I realized I was cringe, I was liberated. And it's like, yeah, because the external is real. And I already broke down how they do the external dance. But the internal, because what do we do with that? The internal is, where am I cringe? Oh, that was so cringe. That was so cringe. Because that's how you get out of phase lock. That's where they can't get in. That's when you're sovereign. Thank you guys so much.